No, it's, here's the situation. I want a clan affiliation. I just and, and my thing is like I should be like the Middle Passage clan because you know most of us came through the Middle Passage. Yes, we went to South America and Central America and the Caribbean. A lot of people, most of them, went there, but we also went to North America, you know, and and some even to England if you want to consider Atlantic Ocean the Middle Passage. So yeah. why can't I want to be? The, I want a clan affiliation. I think Middle Passage clan would be the appropriate one to have. Yeah. Well, I don't think the Middle Classes clan would be the appropriate one to have because. The, the, the different ethnic nations that was leaving the continent under that circumstance did not amalgamate. And they had two months together and they were dispersed. But where the amalgamation takes place and clan formation happens is where they landed. So if you go to Jamaica, you will find a new interpretation of the Akan clan. Mm. You know, the Akans are Ivory Coast and Ghana. If you go to Trinidad, you will see the Yoruba and some Igbo mostly Yoruba, and they've created it, and there's about 75 Yoruba shrines that was in the bush in Trinidad. I'm initiated in the Trinidad shrines. Mm -hmm. And so they didn't come out of the bush until about 15 years ago. They'd been there all this time, hmm. except for one or two. But when we took the Yoruba Congress to Trinidad, they came, they came out of the woods. Hmm. And we were able to realize that all of these retentions were there. When you come to North America, which is the third or fourth largest African population in the world in any single state. Mm. Um, why don't we see more development of traditional African systems than we see even in some of the smaller places? Okay, in conflict. No, because the majority of people who came here were not from those systems. Okay, I, okay. I think I, okay. So one would say, if I go and see the Yoruba in Trinidad, it's obvious because the people are mostly Yoruba. If I see the Voodoo in, in Haiti, I'm looking at Benin. Even though they got some Congo, they had a dominant was Benin and the Fon system. If I go to Jamaica and I see the Rasta movement in the mountains, and I say, and I've been up in those mountains with the Rasta, dancing Mocha Jum, um, what do you call it? I dance at every church up there. <laughs> It's, um, and I'm loved by the others up in those mountains. But that's a, an Akan system that they have um, synthesized. Mm -hmm. What is it in North America? And why we don't see that level of manifestation with the numbers we have and the rural communities we have in North America? And so you see what we call root. I come out of a root house. My grandmother was a root lady. But that's an herbal medicine system, not necessarily a spiritual system in the sense that you have the deities and the shrines and so forth. It's an herbal medicine system and a healing system. Okay, wait, so hold on. I, I, I got you. I'm following this whole thing like this. Can you just, just as an asterisk or something like that, what happens with the condom blade out of Brazil and then more specifically with the Europa that goes through this Cuban line right. and like that? Does, does that have any impact or just not enough numbers for that or what? Oh, no. I mean, in, in North America? Yeah. Because we didn't get a lot of those populations. Remember, we say 400 years, but slavery starts in North America in earnest in the 1700s. Mm. They say 1619, but those um, 15 or 16 persons were indentured and they were free within 20 years and lived their lives out in history, attest to their lives, they chronicle their lives. Mm -hmm. um, you get slavery in the legal aspect in North America in the 1660s. Mm -hmm. You get and appreciable numbers by the 1790s. Mm. Mm. By 1865, it's over. Mm. Mm. That's less than 200 years. Yeah, yeah. Who are these people that make up the North American community of Africans who amalgamated significantly with the Native Americans, which no one wants to talk about. Mm. They talk about the Native Americans being murdered off. No, they got amalgamated into the African population, at least 50% of that population. To save their own lives. Yes. Mm. And there was a mutual cultural understanding because of the relationship to nature that both groups held. Oh, okay. And the view of cosmology that both groups held. Okay. And so people move where it's spiritually comfortable to reside, mm -hmm. uh, you know, this, and, and of course we had the terrorism of European colonialism and genocide and so forth also pushing that process. But the, when you look at where, who was bringing us to North America, yes, the Spanish came in the 1500s. I'm from a group in the Carolinas who was amalgamated with the Chicora Native American people who was almost as dark as we. Mm -hmm. um, we escaped initially, my family, from the Spanish ship. 
1523, in what is now called Winyo Bay in Georgetown. Mm -hmm. So, Spanish don't have any appreciable settlements in North America, except in Florida, mm -hmm. and that doesn't get that significant. French come in for a little while, but the French doesn't have any appreciable settlement where they bring Africans in. It's the British who bring Africans in, and the British have generally come lately to the African transport game. Mm. So what the British was doing, starting in the 1600s, is buying Africans from the Caribbean. Mm. But also, what the North American whites, after they had set up in the New England area, mm. they began to become primary slave runners. Mm. Mm. But they would come back through the Caribbean, and they would end up dropping off what remained of their load in North America. Mm. But they were also exchanging and picking up Africans in the Caribbean. So that means I'm getting people from the Dutch controlled African territory, from the French controlled African territory, from the Brandenburg Germans controlled African territory, from the Spanish controlled African territory, etc. And so they're all coming to America amalgamating. They're not predominantly Yoruba, they're not predominantly Akan, they're not predominantly Congo. The first group that come to America is from the Congo and Angola, and what we might call Namibia, that's the area that the, the mm -hmm. first group. That's mm -hmm. that's where even the concept of Gola or Gala comes from. They're talking about the Angolans, mm -hmm. who are the first mass population to come to the southern part of the United States, South Carolina, North Carolina, mm -hmm. some in Virginia. But what happens, something happens in Africa that changed the dynamic of who the enslaved population that the British would bring in would be. Yeah, but look, hold on, so I'm sorry, I've got to hold on to my little middle passage. Okay, so I'm not a middle passage clan, I'll be a mixed passage clan. I'm, no, I'm going to I'm, I'm gonna get you to the clan, because I've been advocating exactly what you've been advocating okay. for almost two decades now, that we must declare ourselves a clan, and we must declare our tribe, and then we must let the world understand that just like the Yoruba, who didn't exist 5,000 years ago, can be a nation and a clan, but an ethnicity, hmm. or the Igbo, all the archons, they didn't exist 5,000 years ago. Oh, okay, I'll be okay. patient. Okay, I'm here, I'm here, I'm, I'm okay. patient, I'm patient. I'm so, not sure if I can shut up, but I'm patient. Okay, so we come back to the, the Middle Passage. The Middle Passage is emanating primarily from the West Coast of Africa, though some of it is coming from the East Coast of Africa, like Fort Jesus and Mombasa and so forth, but not that much. Most of it is coming from the West, because people are being marched across the continent. It's cheaper. Mm. It's cheaper to march me from Ethiopia to Ghana than to bring me by ship all the way around Africa. Okay. okay. And push, and, you, push you rolling downhill anyway, right? Right. <laughs> so, what happens in the sixth century, a revolution takes place in Northeast Africa, which we call the Middle East. That revolution is called Islam. It is attempting to overthrow the Roman, who are now called the Benzantians, domination of North Africa and the Nile Valley and what we call the Middle East. And the administrators for the Romans in the so-called Middle East are the remnants of the Greco-Roman invaders who we call the Hellionists. We kind of forget this, all right? But now we're in the sixth century, black folks lead a revolutionary movement which is called Islam. It doesn't become a religion until later. When it starts out, it's, it's a resistance movement, it's a liberation movement, which is, you can see by looking at the first two thrusts, the Battle of Badar and the Battle of Yehud. Um, but we won't go into that. But early on, after the death of the Prophet Muhammad, intrigue comes, coup d'etats come, and these family elements kill each other off. And the mercenaries that they hired take over the system. The mercenaries were the Kurds and the Turks. Uh, so, so just like today, people are you're being co-opted, or, or you're, you're, you're being uh, what's that word? They're, you know, you're, you, you're, you're being, being hijacked. Yes, and so by the eighth century, the Turks take the system from the so-called Arabs, and Arabs will never rule over Islam ever again until after the First World War when the British put the Hashemites in power in Jordan and Saudi Arabia. But let's go back. Once this Turkish takeover came, there's a thrust to take over North Africa and the Nile Valley. Why? Because the wheat, the barley, the linen, the gold, etc. That's there. You've got an army, you're conquering the world, you've got to feed them. You've got an army, you've got to finance them. Africa is where the wealth is, then and now. And so the armies moved into the Nile Valley. 
but they're meeting with resistance. And this is Turkish literature. Ibn Khaldun, El Jahiz, Ibn Batutu is writing about this stuff. And so the Turks decided, but dang, we can't defeat these people. Let's just drive them out and bring in some other folks. So there was an ethnic cleansing that happened over almost a hundred years, driving millions of Africans out of what we call Egypt into Sudan, Ethiopia, into the Chad River Basin, into the Central African Republic, and eventually into northern Nigeria and Ghana, Cameroon. Now this population as it's moving between the 10th century and the 16th century, they're refugees. But the slave trade by the 16th century is full-blown, capturing Africans to bring to the Western Hemisphere to work in what was basically a mining and an agricultural mecca for the Europeans. And so I did a, a, a work, it was more than a workshop, it was a conference at Princeton about 20 years ago. Most of the scholars from Africa talking about how did this trade go? Because it wasn't a trade, there was no slave trade. I mean, it's, that's, nobody traded people in slaves. People who had war. This is warfare. People are being captured. Oh, this is being like burned a, down. I call it like a, a land grab and then a depopulation, but it's really a land grab for wealth and. Right. Wealth. But in the beginning, they, they want these workers, these technicians, these agricultural specialists, these miners, because they need them in the West. Hmm. Now, I come to your village and I said, oh, Chief, Nana, Anthony, I will be back. I will be back in one month. I need 50 men, 20 women. You give me, or I'll take them. What do you mean you take them? Hey, hey, hey. hey. You don't have an army. You're a farmer. Oh, well, that's true. You have no army. You have no weapons. These guys got horses, guns, sword. Oh, okay. What are you going to do? Okay, you got a point there. So what ends up happening, you ain't going to send your family. So you're going to get some raiding parties, and you're going into those refugee camps. Those uh, new arrivals uh, yeah. from the east, of have course. no roots, no cultural connections to us, of except course. that a humanity relationship. And this accounts for much of the population that the British will bring to the United States of America. So it's actually, it is a diverse pool. That it, is, it is the most diverse pool oh, okay. in all of Africa. Okay. okay. The North American population is its own clan. And it has an African gene diversity that has no equal. It is appropriate that we refer to ourselves as African mm -hmm. because we are an amalgamation of probably 90% of the gene pools that inhabited the continent at that time. And that amalgam gene pool amalgamation with its amalgamation with the little bit of European it is amalgamated with and the massive form of Native American it is amalgamated with has created another whole clan but another whole historical experience that nobody else in the world has for over 300 years. Mm -hmm. It is that historical experience and our response to that experience that has developed the culture that defines our clan relationships. It's that we have not organized it. It is orally organized. It is not, even though we have a lot of historians trying to do historical narratives saying what happened here, no one has said, let's amalgamate this and identify ourselves in this amalgam. What I'm saying is that this is my clan and we and there is an amalgam. We need to just identify ourselves. Well that's what I say, who's who who whose job it is whose job is it to identify do this at identity? Whoever the consciousness comes to. The things that are done in the world is done based on the consciousness um, that becomes aware of it. You but, know. But, but, but it has to be an agreed consciousness. But it has to have a genesis. Okay, a genesis, but but still, remember, we, we are, in this modern age, we're moving so fast right. that, that if we don't identify real quick, it's and, and I agree it'll be you. hijacked. I agree with you. And already people are trying to hijack it. That's where all the labels come from. That's what I mean. Thus far, we've just been labels. We've been Negroes, that's a label. Um, black is a label. Yeah. African American is a label. Yeah. No one has put the substance to those labels. The substance is what you and I are discussing now. What makes a clan? What makes a clan 
is a group of human beings with a common experience over a certain period of time such that that experience can formulate ideas and principles for survival that is unique to that group of people. But that, but, but uh, it's almost like you have to talk about nation time too because what it actually makes it clear is you also have to have an, uh, not but, only economic, you have to have an army too. Yeah, but all of that becomes a part of the first stage is to understand what makes us or gives us the impetus to want to band together to create what we end up calling a nation. And the impetus of that is the shared historical experiences that gives us the common relationship and development processes. And how we handle that is what is called our culture. Because culture is nothing more than the educational system for intergenerational transmission of wisdom. Mm -hmm. And you being in theater do that very well. Mm -hmm. And so when we think of our clan, whether we want to call ourselves the African Americans, I like the African American, that's a good name for a clan. Um, because the native people from this country is well embedded in our gene pool and much of their foods and much of their habit and much of their experiences. They were having a similar experiences to us. We married into each other. We even created a whole nation called the Seminoles. There was no Seminoles before an amalgamation between the Creek native and the African native. That amalgamation created the Seminole nation. And so... And those guys are tough. They're very tough, you know. And so we need to just claim and own ourselves and then do the work. Much of the historical narrative have been written, but it needs to be some group need to sit down and, 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 and glue it together. This you know? is interesting because um, when I first went to undergraduate school, this is like in, uh, you know, in the 70s, you know, um, my school got destroyed. Uh, by the Rand Corporation, I'm gonna put it. I'm making it short like that mm -hmm. because, and I was wondering. I said, but the, the experiment it's called Livingston College. The experiment, the experiment was running so well. They they would go. They would go to the pool hall to to, to recruit people, you know. And then I realized. <coughs> It wasn't until recently, with all these scholars coming out of the academia, that if we would have mm -hmm. kept on going, then this would have happened much sooner. It so would have happened much sooner. So, so. Carter Woodson speaks to this in the um, the miseducation of the Negro. Listen to him well. The Ron Bennett speaks to this in the shaping of Black America. You know, three decades later, um, Harold Cruz speaks to this, and um, not 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 the crisis of the Negro intellectual. The one he writes after that one is just a fantastic. Anything Harold Cruz wrote is fantastic. By the way, in case you want to get into Dr. Cruz. Um, and I'm looking at a book now that Dr. Asa Hilliard just finished. It's called The Island of Meme. Haiti's unfinished revolution, hmm. but he's only using Haiti as the prototype of the African world. Well, unfinished it's, revolution. A, it's, it's, it's a it's it, a good prototype. <laughs> it is, and 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 what he's talking about is you mu African culture, the way it's structured from ancient Kemet to Akan society, is a culture that affords a people the tools to constantly reinvent themselves recreate themselves. Ah. Okay. When you take away the tools of recreation and reinvention, you're in crisis. And that's what happened to much of our being in the Western Hemisphere. But despite that, if we look at the, our culture, even here in North America, you'll see we innovated on the tools we got from the Native Americans and even some of the tools we got from the Europeans, and we created a system to reinvent ourselves. Mm. We really didn't get off track until we went into the integration process, uh, okay. Okay. okay, which then became a dissolution mm -hmm. of the institutional constructs mm -hmm. we had created for ourselves over our 200-year period now. But also, no. but also, what also I guess is I, I would call it a weeding process because what also impacts on that is this whole uh, notion of, of, of drugs and and yeah, all of those uh, weapons, of debauchery, uh, whatever yeah. you want to call it. You all know of I mean? those things were weapons to keep the African population. You know, we, anthropology and paleontology says the Africans are the genesis people of the human strain. So if you're the genesis people, it means whatever that thing is out of which you emerge, which was the totality of creation that we call the divinity or God, you are then closer to it in terms of construct. If that construct is explained in an external cultural format, which then allows you to reconstruct generation after generation, then you can keep your balance. 
But if someone interferes with that knowledge process, that banking of information, then you end up in the confusion that you find all of the African world pretty much in today. Uh, and that's, and so, that's, that's, that know. confusion, when we break the word confusion, then we, we're going to a Neely Fuller's uh, thing about, right. uh, about white supremacy. If you don't understand white supremacy, everything else will confuse you. Yeah. Okay. okay. And so the, the idea, I'm in a number of secret societies, both in Africa and here. All of them speaks to the same thing. I'm in the Freemasonic tradition and the Prince Hall Lodge, Cornerstone 37. I'm in the uh, the craft out of ancient Kemet, the shrine of Hunefa. I'm in the Akan tradition out of the Agogo kingdom where I'm Nana Kofi and Pansa III of the Agogo stool. I'm in the Yoruba tradition where I hold a priesthood in Uya. I've studied at the shrine of Tigare in Burkina Faso and in northern Ghana trying to find out what is it that our ancestors left for us in terms of body information on how to be the continuum. Of this divine. Yes. Mm. And that's what it's all about. We're constantly trying to repair the, the fragmented, fractured parts of ourselves so that we, we can restore the essence of the divine that is contained within ourselves. Well, this is interesting because uh, because I'm, I'm based in the Eastern Cape of Southern Africa right now, South Africa, mm -hmm. and uh, one of my eternal heroes, you think, think of him as, as the Malcolm X of, of, of Africa for me, mm -hmm. that would be uh, Mangalisa Robert Sabukwe, and he says mm -hmm. to, be Afri to be in Africa means you have to be humane. And that means to me, if you're not human, you need to get off the continent. Yeah. So, but you are taking it one step further. You're saying huma humanity is one thing, but your divinity, divinity is another thing. So, right. how can you connect those two? Right. Well, what some call humanity is simply the behavior of divinity. Uh, so, I'm just taking it where it belongs, planting it at the base. If you take, take the oldest literature that speaks to this that we can find is a book called the Pyramid Text. In the pyramid text, and I can just kind of like ad lib it, it starts out like this, where the divine, which manifests itself as Amun, says, I create myself out of myself. I cause existence to exist so that existing might exist. Mm -hmm. And when I brought existence into, existing into existence, existing began to exist. Mm. It goes further. I am, therefore I am. Exactly. But he goes further. But he starts it, I create myself out of myself. And then he talks about I hiccup and I create shu. Shu is air, moisture, the gases. Mm -hmm. And then he says, I, I spit and I create tefnut, the moisture. And so these are all metaphorical ways to talk about cosmology, mm -hmm. okay, physics and quantum physics. And so in the end, he says, I came into being out of my mother, Nun, the primordial waters, which is liquid matter, and Amun becomes the unknown causation that brought liquid matter from Nun into Ptah, the primordial hill, solid matter. And so this is our literature as we're having this discussion on our understanding of what we now call evolution and how things come into being. So this is our ancestors leaving us information to have this discussion. And so that's why I go back to divinity. Because at the end of the dialogue in the pyramid text, Amun, which who has now become Amun Ray, the hidden unknown causation is now energy manifestation. Ray, energy, sun, radiation. And so he says, and I, who we think is the supreme god came from my mother. Hmm. So he's, no. I is not the source. No. So it is the the mother factor, the feminine factor in the universe that gives birth to the masculine factor, and then create a synergy that allows the feminine and masculine factor to repeat that over, 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 over for infinity. So. so if I may, so for me again, if I'm going with these days where I believe that everything is being hijacked then basically what's happening now, unless we get back to that fem feminine principle, then what has happened, we have allowed the masculine to hijack the feminine for so long that can we, uh, question, yeah. if, we, if, we, if we continue to allow the masculine to hijack the feminine principle for so long, can we ever get back to the feminine principle? Yes, yeah, because it always corrects itself, whether you like it or not. 
the hurricane will come, the tornado will come, I don't care what you do, it will cleanse itself. The flood will come. You can build what you want to build, but when that water feels like claiming its land back, it's going to do it because nature is perfect. Cosmo cosmology is perfect. You are perfect except in your unconscious knowledge of imperfection. Imperfection is no more than ignorance of perfection or, or, or what it takes to be perfect, you know. James, I want to, I get it, I get it, I get it. I want to end it here only because I'm, okay. I'm missing Craig at the blowing, okay. blowing his horn at the church. And now I'm going to be upset with my own self. But mm -hmm. uh, listen, there's something you told me before and I totally forgot and you got to let me know now. There is this, um, you told me about the original story of the person having a dialogue with itself, this African oh, know, dialogue with the soul. Dialogue with the soul. Oh, that, that's the subconscious and the conscious talking about the circumstances of being. The conscious has experienced all the stuff going on in the world and saying, well, I'm tired of shit, I want to commit suicide. The subconscious says, yo, go and do that shit by yourself because that is not my path. And so that's the dialogue. One is trying to convince the other one, I should kill myself and be rid of the misery of the world. And the subconscious is telling the conscious, no, there's a lot to live for, but you have to develop the strength and the understanding to know why. And in the end, you're going to die anyway. So why not wait until that time comes and then you will join, you know, what we call the divine and it will be in harmony and peace and it will be beautiful, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But you gave me a text, but there was some, maybe well, that's not the exact, I like that, but it, there was another, you said there was an original text, somebody is r having a dialogue with themselves. They, they, that's they, the text. But who it's wrote called, the, who was it? It's an ancient Egyptian text. It's called the Papyrus of I. Ah, that's it, the Papyrus, it's, uh, the papyrus of I. Oh. And um, it's, uh, other people have written about it and call it Dialogue with the Soul. Oh. But the the the, the original is papyrus of I. It's a donkey because see it's pointed up as the the image of an uh, of I, and it is in this dialogue. It's a long treaty. I'm just trying to summarize it and probably doing a poor job, but it's a long treaty where this one person. It's like a soliloquy within a soliloquy. Okay. And so instead of having the one-way dialogue, you've got this two-way dialogue coming from the one person. Oh, okay. Yeah. So this, He's not playing different roles. Mm -hmm. He's having the dialogue with, with itself. Okay, no, no. This, this, this gives that's me, why it's called the dialogue with the soul. Well, this gives me my, my ultimate assignment because, you know, as an audio dramatist, this is my challenge to, to dramatize all of this. Well, you're good at it. You were good before you left home all those many years ago, and I know you've gotten extraordinarily better. Um, but back to your clan, you have a clan. We simply have to declare and own our clan. I own my clan. I'm from the African-American clan. I'm from the clan that has more of the African gene pool synthesized in one community than any other African clan in the world. Thus, we also have fragments of all of those cultural pieces which we have spun off using the Christian motif that has made it more dynamic than any other cultural expression using our music, our theater, um, in a way that no one else has done it anywhere in the world. And I think part of why we've been so dynamic, because within that musical expression that we do, from hip hop to bebop to jazz to blues to spiritual, in that is tiny little pieces of the rhythms of all of Africa. And that's why it's accepted so readily across the world. Thanks, James. You're welcome, sir.